All right, perfect timing too, because we were right up at 1.30. Um, so I'll, I'll say a quick introduction uh, for Dr. Daphne Tan. So hi, my name is Theodora. Uh, my friends call me Theo, so feel free to refer to me as Theo anytime you need to. And I have just finished my second year of engineering science and I'm a co-op student with the EdTech office uh, for this summer. Today I'm introducing Dr. Daphne Tan, whose preferred pronoun, pronouns are she, her, hers. She's an assistant professor of music theory in the faculty of music. Uh, Dr. Tan's research addresses questions about music and the mind with methodologies and perspectives from the history of music theory and music cognition. I'll drop a link in the chat. So if you'd like to read more about Dr. Tan's research online, um, right after I finish reading the introduction. <laughs> and going forward, Dr. Tan will continue to offer certain components of her course online. Dr. Tan's presentation today is called Hitting Repeat, Lessons Learned from Teaching Music Theory Online. Today's session will be recorded and shared after the workshop. And don't forget to join Dr. Tan in Gather Town from 3 to 3.30 for her fountain side chat. So Dr. Tan, I will pass it over to you. Okay, thank you so much, Theo. That that's great. Um, thanks everyone for joining me today. And I'd like to thank uh, Alison Van Beek for inviting me to speak and for organizing this wonderful workshop. Um, I've really been inspired by the talks I've heard today already. So as Theo mentioned, I'm an assistant professor in the Faculty of Music. Um, and so today I'm going to discuss my experiences teaching music theory in an online environment. Um, and my plan is to talk for um, about 20 to 25 minutes and to leave um, uh, several minutes for questions, at least that's the plan. Um, and as Theo said, I'm also gonna be available uh, for a Fountainside chat if I can find it on Gabbertown. Okay, so, um, okay, so one of the courses I taught this semester was a large enrollment undergraduate course called Music Theory 4. And uh, just for some context, I had taught similar courses at peer institutions, but this was my first time teaching this course at the University of Toronto. And so like many of you, it was also my first time teaching um, online. And what I found was that uh, the combination of designing a course from scratch plus being forced to teach online actually gave me an opportunity to implement elements of a flipped or inverted classroom. And this is something that I had always wanted to try, but just then um, never really had a chance to before. Um, so after I show you how I um, uh, use this flip model in my class, I'm going to discuss um, the biggest challenge that I face, which was creating video micro lectures. Um, again, for some context, I consider myself to be a competent technology user, but I don't really have any special technology training. Um, and I actually don't really enjoy experimenting with technology all that much. Um, I'm often looking for the simplest yet most effective approach. Okay. So it turns out that this mode of delivery was quite um, successful or quite effective this semester, and I am planning to reuse it um, in future semesters, even when we go back in person. So um, I will end the presentation with uh, sharing some of the rewards that I observed this semester. Okay, so Music Theory 4 is the final course in a four-semester undergraduate sequence. Um, it is a requirement for many uh, students in many degree programs. And um, this semester I had 60 students enrolled and there were 40 students uh, enrolled in a different section taught by another instructor. I was uh, very fortunate to have three lovely uh, graduate assistants um, who <clears throat> were present for all synchronous uh, Zoom uh, meetings and also led tutorials um, on their own. I'm just going to give you on the next couple slides um, um, a brief look at uh, what this course is about and then also uh, some of our learning outcomes. So this is straight from the syllabus. Uh, this course focuses on music composed since 1900 and it's uh, designed to provide students with analytical methodologies for music that goes beyond um, the Western common practice uh, tonality. So some of the activities that we do in this course include listening to newly composed music. We study scores and we analyze them. Uh, students uh, provide um, or engage in written assignments, and they also complete two independent projects. Um, among the learning outcomes, okay, so um, when students successfully complete the course, my expectation is that they're going to have the tools and vocabulary to, in particular, uh, convey specific listening strategies and analytical observations through written prose and symbolic notation, um, as well as through oral presentation, visual representation, and uh, 
potentially model composition as well. So I cannot emphasize more strongly enough that um, the focus here in this class and in many or most music theory classes is on skill acquisition. We're really trying to um, have students connect sight and sound, make connections between the activities of composition, performance, and listening, sort of tying it all together. So in a regular class period, we're going to be actively uh, listening and watching videos, for instance, on YouTube. Um, or we're going to be listening to recordings through Naxos or Spotify. We're going to be looking at uh, visual scores, right? Um, and in the 20th and 21st century, some of these scores are really unfamiliar to students. And so they require extensive discussion. And we're also gonna do a lot of annotation um, and, and looking at how pieces are structured and put together. So it's a highly multimodal class. Um, and in addition to of these sort of visual and oral elements, you know, um, students are often singing together and I'm often using the piano, uh, which is in every classroom uh, for demonstration. So it's a highly multimodal environment. Oops. So um, prior to the pandemic, uh, theory four was delivered um, by other instructors as a, uh, with a lecture tutorial model that's really typical for all of our core undergraduate courses at the Faculty of Music. So there were two required lectures, um, again, with 60 uh, students in attendance. And then um, on Thursdays, students would break out into smaller tutorial sections, and these were led by uh, teaching assistants. So this semester, when we all went online, um, I was given the choice of either uh, delivering two asynchronous lectures, in other words, I would never meet my uh, students synchronously, um, plus asynchronous tutorial, or what I chose, um, creating one lecture's worth of asynchronous content um, and then delivering one synchronous lecture on Zoom. And then of course there was also that one synchronous tutorial on Zoom. Um, this combination of asynchronous and synchronous delivery was actually more successful than I could have imagined at the start of the semester. And I liked it so much that I actually asked the Associate Dean of um, Academic and Student Affairs in February uh, whether I could retain this model in future iterations of this course. And so um, I was fortunate that he actually said yes. And so uh, in winter 2022 and beyond, um, and with all 100 students, I'm actually going to be reusing all of my asynchronous materials um, and then um, we'll be seeing my students uh, once a week in person lecture. So let me get into why um, I found this uh, to be quite successful. So one of the reasons I chose the asynchronous and synchronous format of delivery um, is that it gave me an opportunity to implement elements of uh, flipped teaching. Uh, which is something I've always wanted to try. So, you know, uh, for those of you present, I'm sure most of, or many of you um, have heard of this pedagogical approach before. It's, it's an established pedagogical model. Um, and it's been discussed in music theory pedagogy circles for around a decade now. Um, as Phil Duker, who is a music theorist um, and his colleagues describe, um, quote, in an inverted classroom, students acquire basic comprehension of a topic outside of class, and then they come to class to deepen their understanding and actively apply their knowledge. So in a traditional uh, lecture-based music theory class, class time is spent on activities that require um, cognitive processes that are perhaps lower down on Bloom's revised taxonomy, um, such as remembering information or understanding information. So the instructor might spend most of their time introducing new concepts and uh, introducing problem solving strategies. They might demonstrate those strategies and they might direct students in a few in-class activities. But then uh, students are left to themselves to engage in higher order tasks at home. So in a flipped music theory class or in a flipped class in general, students acquire basic knowledge before coming to class, either through um, uh, technology, technologically mediated means such as video lectures or podcasts or through non-technological means such as just readings or handouts. And then class time is spent developing fluency uh, with these new ideas um, and engaging more deeply with topics through creative activities and critical discussion. 
again, this is not a new model. And, you know, um, if you've uh, if you taught us a, a seminar, for instance, an upper level uh, undergraduate seminar or a graduate seminar, you know, this model will feel familiar to you. This is uh, what seminars are based on. So at the undergraduate level, though, there are several documented advantages. Um, and he so here are some of them. The first is that students acquire can acquire basic knowledge, okay, that sort of uh, first pass at that information at their own pace. And they can return to those ideas repeatedly. So they're not just dependent on the notes that they sort of scramble to take down in class. Um, also for this reason, there's increased accessibility. So for instance, um, if we're still talking about videos, videos off should or can include closed captioning. Um, and students are able to adjust the speed, right? So slowing it down if they need to hear something um, um, again, or maybe even speeding up if, if the information um, is already familiar to them. This then frees up in-class time for greater interaction between class members, be it between students and the instructor or peer-to-peer -peer interactions. And um, as a re result, students are able to complete higher level tasks in the presence of peers and instructors, and this can facilitate um, feedback um, in the moment. And all of this has the potential to foster uh, greater metacognition, collaboration, and a sense of community among uh, class, um, class members. So this is so great. And you might ask then, why hadn't I done this sooner? And the first reason is that, you know, video micro lectures and other sort of introductory materials can be very time consuming, whether you're creating them or curating them. And this is especially the case uh, for more advanced courses. So I do want to mention that there are plenty of excellent videos online already on YouTube and elsewhere created by professional music theorists for more rudimentary skills. But for this fourth semester course that I was teaching, I really had to create um, all of the content more or less from scratch. And um, in addition, it, this required really careful planning of asynchronous and synchronous materials in such a way that students really understand how one activity relates to the next, right? You don't want a whole bunch of random activities and with the hope that uh, things stick, you want to make sure that students are aware of how it flows together. So with that said, um, uh, there are certain key elements um, that Cynthia Brame and other colleagues at other institutions um, have, um, have noted, okay, it should be included in um, a flipped or inverted classroom um, for it to be successful. So the first is to provide an opportunity for students to gain first exposure prior to class. So it's really important to have clear materials that are easy for students to navigate on their own when they're by themselves. The second is to provide an incentive for students to prepare for class. So this can be through some sort of um, point system. Um, it could be simply pass fail or a completeness grade. Um, it could be a quiz. And it could also just be building in accountability measures in the classroom itself. For instance, making sure that in-class conversations um, start from the assumption that students have prepared uh, the material prior to class. Third, there may, needs to be a mechanism to assess student understanding of the uh, basic materials and then be able to respond to those assessments in, um, in class. And finally, um, we need to develop in-class activities that focus, focus then on higher level uh, cognitive tasks. So with all of these sort of elements for success in mind, um, this is how, or this is what I did um, in Music Theory 4. And this is sort of the weekly schedule at a glance. So on Sundays, I would publish um, micro lectures that I would create as alongside um, handouts, any musical scores, um, a playlist with all of the repertoire that we were going to listen to that week, and then a weekly assignment. Then um, on Wednesday, uh, there would be a quiz due based on the asynchronous material, and that would be due um, a, an hour before our synchronous lecture. Then when we were all together on Zoom, uh, we would explore concepts um, in greater depth. There would be hands-on analysis of compositions. We would listen to music and discuss it um, either with camera and, and, and sound on or uh, through the chat. 
Thursday's tutorial with the teaching assistants uh, focus on activities that would model the weekly assignment, and then the weekly assignment would be due uh, the following Monday. Okay, so here that's the sort of the, the uh, schedule in a nutshell. And I do want to uh, mention that I actually consider my flip to be only partial because there were still um, quite a bit of in-class instruction during that Wednesday lecture, um, especially for more complex topics. And especially, I think, because we were in that Zoom environment, I probably lectured and sort of talked a lot more than I would in an in-person environment um, where there would be sort of more um, uh, breakout groups and um, small group discussions. Okay, so I want to briefly uh, show you how I organized or how I guided the students um, through this sort of weekly plan on Quirkus. So I'm just going to go there uh, for a few minutes. And so this is my course site. Um, and so I uh, created um, pages for each week of the semester. And uh, let's just go to week seven. Um, so here you can see that um, it's clearly indicated to students uh, the asynchronous materials that they need to complete before lecture, uh, the materials that they should have with them during the lecture on Wednesday, materials for the tutorial, and then our playlists. So um, just wanted to highlight the quizzes I created in Quirkus, right? This is to uh, um, assess understanding prior to uh, seeing them synchronously. So um, the quizzes were all, for the most part, not all, but the majority of them were auto graded. So I didn't have to, um, I didn't have to look at specific answers and the students could um, attempt them an unlimited number of times before uh, lecture on Wednesday. So most of the questions are multiple choice and um, they draw on information from the micro, uh, micro lecture videos that I had created. Um, I wanted to note too that I had several guest lecturers um, who graciously um, um, gave up their time and, and joined us throughout the semester. And um, I actually requested that they too provide me with asynchronous, asynchronous material uh, prior to their uh, synchronous visit. So um, just as an example, Let's go to quiz number seven. So in um, in week five, my colleague, uh, my ethnomusicology colleague, uh, Dr. Farzi Hamasi, um, visited us that week to talk about Eastern Arabic um, uh, makamat or melodic modes. And so uh, Dr. Hamasi and I collaborated on this quiz, this three question quiz, uh, which allowed students to listen to a few examples of these modes in context and to get um, to get them thinking about their own impressions or their own uh, responses to this music that might have been unfamiliar to them. And this is before Dr. Hamasi uh, gave her sort of more formal introduction to the topic. Okay. So uh, that those are the quizzes. Let me talk just a little uh, very briefly about uh, those video micro lectures that I've been referring to. And this was truly uh, the greatest challenge for me because again, I'm technically competent, but um, I'm not uh, really any specially skilled in, in any way. Um, and I think too, that there are sort of demands of the music theory environment, which add to the challenge. So again, um, a typical music theory class invo involves score annotation, music notation, live sound via a piano, um, and then recorded sounds and recorded videos. Um, so I had to try to sort of incorporate all of that into my videos. Um, I wanted to make sure that these lectures were as clear, concise, well-paced and accurate as possible. So I actually scripted each one and I edited them down to around 15 minutes, sometimes a little bit more, sometimes a little bit less. And I really wanted to make um, these micro lectures interactive. So I didn't expect students to just watch them, you know, from the beginning to the end, but instead to pause the video at certain spots, annotate their own scores or fill out a worksheet and then hit play again uh, for the solution. So all of this took a long time. Um, I devoted um, uh, full Saturdays, okay, to creating these videos. Um, and part of this reason is that, or one of the reasons is that I uh, really 
uh, created them with an eye to reusing these videos. And this was even before I had talked to my, uh, to my department chair about replacing that one in-person lecture. I figured that, you know, at, um, at the very least, I could post them online for students to review their materials. So I did put in quite a bit of effort to create these. So now I'm going to ask uh, Theo if you might uh, please play a few short clips. Um, I have uh, three clips that I'd like to show you just to give you a sense of um, what, what one of these lectures looks like. So this is all from a lecture on musical minimalism that I created. So the first clip is the very beginning of the video. And this is to show you how I sort of set the stage, incorporating some of the music that we're going to be talking about. And then I actually do show my face for a little bit just to make that personal connection. Uh, so please. This week in class, we're exploring minimalism. Minimalist music originated in the United States in the 1960s, and it had a... Great, thank you so much. Um, okay, so the next clip that I'm gonna play for you um, just is just to demonstrate how um, the videos uh, needed to be able to incorporate a digital piano and how I um, annotated the scores to uh, to guide uh, students through um, through interpreting uh, some of the symbolic notation. Uh, please. As you can hear, the repeated unit is a diatonic pattern and it emphasizes stacked fourths. Total duration of this repeated. Oh, sorry, sorry. Uh, keep going. Unit is twelve eighth notes or twelve beats, and so I'm just going to go ahead and um, mark those twelve beats using the same system of counting that we've used for pitch and order positions. So from zero all the way to eleven. Okay, thank you. And the final clip um, is just to show how I incorporated um, some recorded um, music into these um, into these videos as well. So once at rehearsal six, in this piece, um, the pattern of the two violins is fixed, and this will continue to play throughout the remainder of the performance. It sounds like this. <laughs> Beginning at rehearsal nine, violin two does something a little great. different. Thank you. Okay, great. So I'm gonna take back control. Okay, great. So um, just for those interested um, to know my home setup, uh, these were the sort of tools that I used. Um, and I really should stress that um, I didn't have a dedicated tech assistant. Um, my teaching assistants uh, uh, were music theorists and composers like me, and they led tutorial sections and graded. Um, and actually the entire faculty of music only has one employee who is dedicated to educational technology, but I have the great benefit of being married to them. Um, so I did get these tech recommendations um, from, from my spouse. Okay, so I'm, I'm gonna uh, sort of wrap up here by sharing um, some of the rewards that I found um, from using this, um, using this model of teaching. So in the middle of the semester, I distributed an informal uh, anonymous survey. And among the questions I asked my students was what's working for you right now? And I was really heartened to receive many comments that affirm the value of the asynchronous plus uh, synchronous model. And students in particular um, really appreciated the concision of the videos and um, coupled with the low stakes uh, quizzes. So for example, um, this last comment here says, um, I really loved how the short lecture videos are around 15 minutes and super concise. The quiz is helpful as well and allowing for multiple attempts really allows me to learn from my mistakes and apply my learning. So we love to hear it. Um, 
additionally, to my surprise, um, I found that I got to really know my 60 students pretty well through the course of the semester, um, even in this online environment. Um, I found that there was a real sense of community during our synchronous lectures. My TAs were amazing at monitoring the chat and responding to students in real time. And I was able to encourage peer-to-peer -peer conversations because I didn't feel rushed for time um, feeling I had to get through content. So we could really delve into, uh, delve into discussing, um, uh, discussing these topics. I also found that students got more out of our featured guest speakers uh, because uh, those guest speakers had provided the asynchronous material before they visited. And so the content was fully integrated into the flow of the course and students were able to refer to this content in weeks after. And finally, um, sort of an unexpected benefit was that my own micro lectures provided a good model for students' video presentations and uh, their projects were done at a really high level. I found in general this semester that technology allowed most of my students to convey their ideas in a clearer, more creative way than I had observed in the past. Um, so all in all, I was really pleased with how the semester went, but maybe that's because my expectations were pretty low going into this online only um, environment. Um, so I will be very interested to see how things go when we're back in person. So um, that is all I have for today. I have a few references here. Um, oh, I will share my uh, slides in the chat for those of you who'd like these references, um, but I'd love to take your questions and comments now. Thank you so much, Dr. Tan. Um, if there are any questions, we've got about uh, four minutes left. So if anyone would like to drop them in the chat or feel free to unmute yourself or raise your hand and ask your questions. Oh, we do have a question um, from Deborah. Okay, go ahead. Thanks so much, Daphne. I, I, um, I, this was great and it's given me all kinds of ideas for my course. Um, and I just wanted to ask you a little bit about the virtual tutorials that you had this term. Um, so the students, I'm assuming, were creating things, working on things in those tutorials. I don't know if I've got that wrong, but yes. um, if so, what, what, what did you do to sort of facilitate that kind of um, team creative collaboration? in in the virtual space yeah so um the weekly assignment that that um students had to complete uh was usually in the form of some sort of worksheet um so in music theory we often introduce an analytical tool and then we apply it to a musical composition let's say um but sometimes the worksheet if it's a very brand new tool then they need to have sort of more rudimentary exercises that leads them through how to how to apply it so um, so then in the tutorial, I would create a worksheet that was um, identical in format to the assignment. It would use a different composition, but it would have very similar questions. So students could use breakout groups, for instance, or the TAs would break students out into groups of, let's say, three to four students, and they would work on the worksheet together and then come back and the TA would guide them through solutions. So that's sort of one way that um, I, that was actually a very typical way in which class time was structured um, on Thursdays. D does that answer? Yeah, yeah. I was just, I, I guess I was more curious about whether they were actually engaged in any kind of composition activity, uh, uh, um, collaborative composition activity. Yeah, um, because that's sort of my focus as well as sort of the collaborative creation. Um, so I'm, I was just curious about that, but yeah. Yeah, um, I think if uh, if I was to if I was teaching, um, I, yes, uh, the the short answer is yes. I could see how that that uh, that could be implemented. Uh, it wasn't necessarily a primary focus of this course, but um, for example, in in my the graduate course I teach, uh, students do work in pairs on a class project that carries them throughout the semester, and they use uh, cloud based technology to do that. Um, so they'll they'll use a shared uh, shared documents. Um, in OneDrive, for instance. Um, right. So for music notation, I could see them using MuseScore um, or sort of other um, 
uh, open source software uh, that could be that they could collaborate on uh, in real time. Thank you so much.